Okay, well, let's get started because it's five after and it's exciting and we get to hang out with Cole today. Um, I'm sure most people on this call know who Cole is uh, from Storytelling with Data. Uh, Cole, thanks so much for coming on to one of these discussions. Great to yeah. see you. Thanks for inviting me. Good to see you and everybody here. Um, Again, no agenda for these things. So for anyone who's been on these, they know there's no agenda. It's very casual. Um, if you have questions for Cole, you can pop them in the chat window and we'll just build up a queue. Um, and uh, you can unmute yourselves when it's your turn and you can talk to Cole directly. I am just your moderator for today. So I thought maybe, I don't know, Cole, do you want to just like introduce yourself and talk about what you've been up to since we've all been kind of on lockdown. Um, sure. Start I can there. Uh, so I'm Cole, uh, CEO at Storytelling with Data, and I always describe what we do or often describe what we do as helping individuals and organizations make graphs that make sense and weave those into compelling stories to try to influence understanding and action. And so that mainly means workshops where we go into an organization, spend half a day or a day with a team talking about both foundational principles for communicating effectively with data, but going beyond just the data and really thinking smartly about how we communicate it for our audience. Uh, we have a blog and a podcast and everything that goes along with it. Uh, Storytelling with Data Community, which is relatively new still, which is an online place where everybody can go to practice and get feedback. And there's exercises and a whole host of things there that we can talk about more. Uh, but yeah, this has been an interesting time because we usually go in person to places and present in rooms full of people, uh, which has not been happening for a while now. So like many, we've been figuring out how do you take what we've been doing and try to virtualize it, right, in this yeah. travel-free sort of environment. So uh, we've been doing that. We actually just had our first fully virtual public workshop last week where we had over 100 people from all over the world tune in to stare at their computer and chat and do some practice for five hours, uh, which wow. was a ton of fun. Yeah. But yeah. It makes us rethink how we do some of this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you maybe, do you want to talk maybe a little bit about the community? Because that's relatively yeah. new. And so maybe, I'm not sure if everybody knows about it because that might be, um, might be interesting for folks to hear about. Absolutely. So the Storytelling with Data community is an online community. So I'm a big believer that to get good at this stuff, to get good at visualizing data, communicating with data means practicing and getting feedback and giving feedback and engaging with other people who are doing work with data to try to share challenges and success stories and learn from each other. And so the community's been crafted to try to facilitate all of these things. So there are, uh, there's the regular monthly challenge that we do there uh, where each month has a different topic. So it might be, you know, this month we're going to create an annotated line graph, go find some data of interest, create a line graph on a topic of your choice and share it with everybody and give each other feedback. And it, it ends up both being a cool space just to practice something with a little bit of guidance, but also a ton of flexibility in terms of what data, what tools, all of that sort of stuff. But then it also ends up being a really interesting repository of graphs, uh, which then become searchable, or you can go back and look through the archives to see different things. This month, the focus is a little different. This month, uh, Alex on the team is challenging everyone to redesign an object from your daily lives. So I am totally going to redesign Google Classroom, which is the bane of my existence right now. <laughs> Um, but all of that detail can be found at community.storytellingwithdata.com. It's free. It takes like less than two minutes to sign up and you'll see a host of stuff there. We did also just a couple of weeks ago launch the premium version of the community, which is everything that I just talked about, plus regular office hours where if you have specific feedback that you want to tune into a, a Zoom session like this to talk to someone on the team, uh, there are videos uh, ranging from the tactical, you know, how do you do this thing in Excel or Tableau to the more strategic big picture things to think about when communicating with data. And we're also doing monthly live events. And we have our next one of those coming up on the 28th of May. Nice. Yeah. Um, let me, uh, before I ask my next question, let me just uh, remind folks that if you have uh, questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat window. And as I said that, we already got our first question. So, which is great because then I could just sit back 
<laughs> so, um, Nawaz, if you want to unmute yourself, feel free. Um, otherwise, cool. You can just, um, uh, I guess, read the question. I'm, yeah. Yeah. All right. So we learned about slope graphs from my book. Awesome. I love hearing that. Uh, how do you get around creating a slope graph when there are lots of categories? Some points overlap. It can be less clear. Is there an alternative to simply excluding some of the categories? Yeah. So you always want to think about what context is going to be important depending on you know, the data you're communicating and who you're communicating it to. Uh, oftentimes when you have a ton of categories in a slope graph, and a slope graph, by the way, is just a fancy word for a line graph that only has two points in it, where you can see really quickly by virtue of, you know, is the line flat or does it increase or decrease in one direction or the other, gives you a quick sense of where things are changing, uh, which can be useful for two points in time, can also be useful for group comparisons. Uh, you know, if we're running a survey and we want to understand how uh, one segment of the population compares against another. We can put those on the separate axes to be able to see those. And so oftentimes when you have a ton of categories, you don't necessarily care about all of them. Uh, and now it doesn't mean you necessarily eliminate them because just that context can be important of, you know, how, how spread out are the lines, how flat or uh, angled are they? And so a lot of times you can get away with, you know, there'll be a couple that you want to focus on and you can push the rest to the background uh, where you make them all gray or you maybe don't label every single category uh, and then you put emphasis on the ones that you do want people to pay attention to. Or if, you, if you're using motion, if you're in a live setting or it's something where there's any sort of video, you can cycle through and focus on different ones at, or different lines at a time. Uh, or you can also turn it into a panel chart where you actually just have multiple iterations of the slope graph where you may still have all of the lines on each in gray, but you emphasize just one or a couple in each panel, which allows you to then be able to see what's going on and highlight more different things. There was actually, I mentioned the challenge earlier, but there was one of the monthly challenges, uh, I think it was January of this year, uh, was on small multiples. So you'll see some examples similar to the panel chart that I talked about there. Yeah, interesting. Thank you very much. Um, very useful. Great. I know us. Okay, great. Cool. Okay, great. First question in the book already. That's great. Um, so I'll just let that, I'll just let that uh, marinate. Uh, feel free again to put your questions in. Um, in the meantime, Cole, I was wondering how you think, um, not quite sure what this question is, but how you think data viz or maybe uh, strategic data viz in terms of building teams and that sort of things uh, is going to change because of, of COVID. Um, even though it it hopefully has a finite end, right? There's at some point some vaccine, or so there's there's yep. some viral drug um, or antiviral drug. Um, but how do things change in and around this pandemic when it comes to the the, the sort of groups that you work with? Yeah, it's a great question, and uh, you know, it, everybody is guessing. I think at yeah, best yeah, right. at this point, because so I I think that we probably don't go back to normal in the way normal was before. You figure there are there are new habits that are being formed uh, by the way people are working today. And I have to imagine, and maybe I get proven wrong on this, that could totally be the case, but that there may be some hesitancy in bringing groups together in the way that we have. So when we think about how, how we work as teams, uh, you know, how we uh, are experiencing learning, right? I think all of those things are going to look a little different going forward. I think one of the benefits of the environment today is it's forced a lot of people who may, and a lot of organizations who may have been resistant to things being virtual and working from home and having, uh, having that work that everybody's been forced into it pretty much. And so, and, and, and I think we're getting surprised in a number of ways of the things that do work. And I'm a perfect example of this. Historically, I said, no, we're not doing virtual workshops. That's, that's not going to work, right? The, the benefit is you're in person. You can see the responses. You can walk around the room. You can respond to these things. And I was happy to be proven wrong here, right? Because it's one of our main revenue streams, but that no, it actually, it can be done. There 
different trade-offs or costs and benefits with both, right? You think of the scale that you get with a virtual session. Our virtual workshop last week, we had people tuning in from Malaysia and Jordan, and they, they wouldn't have come to Milwaukee for the workshop we were planning in person. So you get a sense of reach, I think, that can be really valuable. Um, but there are trade-offs, right? Because the interaction, then you have to just be creative about trying to make that work in different ways. Now, yeah. what does it mean for data visualization as a job and as a team, right? Because a big, a big part of, of doing this well and iterating and getting better over time is being able to pop into the office next door and get feedback or talk to somebody down the hall or the water cooler sort of discussions that happen. And so I think we have to figure out, you have to be more intentional about seeking that sort of feedback in this environment. Uh, and I think those who figure out how to do that for the pieces of today's environment that, oh, I like the cat across the screen, that's good, uh, that, that stick, that that will help make everyone feel a little more equipped when it comes to doing some of these things, which is a really long winded way of me not answering your question directly at all. No, no, <laughs> I mean, I don't think, yeah, I mean, I, I, no, but I think you hit all the right, the, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, so, I agree. I don't think there is an answer, but I think you hit the right points of, are people going to want to attend events? Yeah. What, um, what do you think? What's your feeling? I mean, I, I think, um, well, I think there's a few things to say. I mean, I, I think first off, you know, there's obviously a big concern about how does the economy recover and how do businesses come back? I think yeah. as, as, as terrible as it is that so many businesses are going to go under, um, the nature of the pandemic is going to be finite. It's going to end and other businesses are going to come in. Yep. Um, you know, lots of restaurants go out of business every day um, and other restaurants come in. I think it also opens up an entirely new world of virtual communication and virtual working from home for businesses. Um, but I think more in the short run, the real challenge is going to be how do employers change their physical space? Um, yes. Because if you think about a restaurant, you know, I've worked in lots of restaurants, right? The kitchens are really packed with people and I'm not sure how many people want to be close to each other. Same thing with dining but rooms. Then just the things that we see that work now, right? My husband uh, tells the story about how it's fantastic. He goes to, uh, what is it? The Office Depot or not Office Depot, the electronic one, um, Best Buy, right? And he yeah. doesn't even have to go in the store. He like puts in his order online right. and shows up and does a text and, and they come and like put stuff in the trunk of his car. You yeah. never have to talk to a person. You never have to. Like, I love that. But then it, it does beg the question of like, what happens to commercial real estate, right? As businesses right. realize they can use this model and not yeah. necessarily have to have showrooms. And yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We're getting I mean, I really love not having to go. I love not having to go into the liquor store because I know exactly what I want to get. <laughs> so I just tell them that this is what I want and they just put it in the car. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, I think my, with respect to data is specifically, and I've, I've, you and I have talked about this and I've written about, I worry a little bit about how businesses will um, approach their data viz needs and staffing. Yep. Um, because we've been for the last decade in an economic, well, not, not necessarily expansion, but we've been growing. Um, and I wonder whether data viz and data communication is one of the things that they'll cut. Um, I think one scary factor that could play into that as well is it seems that the current environment is breeding a lot of distrust around data. Yeah. And I think that could go in one of two directions, right? Either the scenario you describe, it makes that much worse of like, not only are we not investing in people to visualize data, but we actually don't even trust the data anymore. Right. And we're not going to use it to make decisions or it could go the other direction, right? Which is, holy crap, if we, if we couldn't get this right and understand what was going on, we need to throw more people and brain yeah. at this and get smarter about how we do things. Right. And thinking so, about, you know, how do we, how do we try to push the path? <laughs> right. So on a, on a macro level to that, to that point, where do you think we will be? I think I'll just give you my short uh, answer to my own question. <laughs> um, you know, I think we've seen a, a pretty um, strong uh, bias or, um, you know, hit against science and against objective data and against research. And I sort of felt at the very beginning of this whole pandemic that maybe things were, were pushing back on that a little bit with, you know, more respect and appreciation for scientists and for the CDC and for Dr. Fauci. And yet over the last 
week to 10 days, maybe a couple weeks, it seems like it's flipped back again. So I wonder, I mean, again, there's no answer to this, but I just wonder where you think we'll, we'll, where we'll be. I hope that it all ends up highlighting for people the importance of data and the importance of having good data and the importance of doing smart things with data and that it ends yeah. up pushing us in the direction of wanting to invest more in the skill sets, in developing these skill sets and the people who have these skill sets when it comes to everything. But yeah. whether, yeah, how that plays out. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. shall see. Okay, I'm gonna stop asking you questions, even though I love chatting with you. Um, I'm gonna let some other people talk. Um, so uh, Megan Longoria has a question for you. Um, and I'll just let <laughs> Megan, if you just wanna unmute yourself, um, you can go ahead. She's in here somewhere. Hi, Megan. Sure. Hi. Um, so I was curious about your thoughts on, on dynamically you know, refreshing data. So you have whatever, your sales dashboard, your HR dashboard yeah. that gets new data every day, hour, week and how you talk to people about, you know, there's still some element of story in there, but it's, it's kind of different. Absolutely, yeah, great question. And so I'll often talk about a distinction between exploring data and explaining data. And the books, uh, the workshops, we spend more time on that latter piece, right? You've already explored your data, you have something to say about it, now what do you wanna say and how do you do that effectively? And so we end up focusing more on static visuals as a result of that because we've already figured out what the, so to speak, story is and what we wanna communicate out of that. Dashboard for me sits more in that exploratory side of things where the dashboard is absolutely an essential tool. It helps us explore the data faster, right? Where we can look through things quickly, get a sense of where are things in line with our expectations? Where are they not in line with our expectations? We hopefully have subject matter experts who are monitoring those and flagging things when there's something to pay attention to. And so for me, the way that dashboards and story fit together is the dashboards, if they're designed well in terms of the data that they're showing, should make the interesting and important stories easier to find, easier to surface. But then once we've used the dashboard to identify that thing we want to communicate, it often means taking it out of the dashboard and employing a lot of the lessons that we talk about in the books and in the workshops and so forth to make sure those things don't get missed. Because the challenge is when you take the dashboard that's meant for the subject matter expert and now you try to communicate broadly with it to people who are not the subject matter experts, uh, you know, it can be overwhelming. They may make bad assumptions about what exactly it is they're looking at or how to interpret it. Uh, they may just not pay attention because there's too much going on or they may focus on completely the wrong thing and you sort of lose that that uh, ability to direct <laughs> attention in that way. So when there is something, so I'm against the idea, generally there are probably exceptions to this, but I'll put it out there, against the idea of like an executive dashboard or dashboards for senior leaders because it's trying to mince things in ways that I, I get the reason behind it, but I don't think it probably gains the efficiency that it's uh, intending to. That for a senior audience, for a busy audience, for an audience who just wants to know the so what, that's where we have to use the dashboard to find the stories and then tell the story instead of just give the dashboard. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Megan. Um, Kristen has a question for you, Cole, um, about, um, big gaps. So Kristen, oh, there you are. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, so my question is a lot of times I have to deal with data where there's big gaps between the high and low values. Um, and maybe sometimes it's just like one or two outliers, but sometimes it's really like big chunks of high values and um, then big chunks of low values. And I really struggle to represent those while keeping the graph readable. Um, do you have any tips for that? Yeah, absolutely. This is a great question. It's a, a common challenge, right? Where you just have things that are very differently sized. So there are a number of potential alternative things you can try depending on the scenario. And actually, I'll start with one. The Department of Transportation, there's an example I can dig up on this, um, or you can find it on their Twitter feed. Uh, but they did a really slick thing that I saw recently, and I forget exactly what they were graphing, but it was, it was something by state where, you know, of course, California and New York had these massive values, and then everybody 
everybody else had these tiny values. And the way they dealt with that was they, they had two graphs together where the first one was top five and it had a scale that, you know, went out crazy for, um, for California, New York and the big ones. And then it was actually a separate graph where there was space between it. The axis was at the top. So you saw that it was a different scale before you got to the data. And then they had all the rest where they were able to zoom in a bit on that, where they still left it so you could see there was magnitude of difference between the top five and everybody else. But they expanded the scale on that bottom one so that you could see the difference between states, which I thought was an interesting solution in the way they titled it and organized the data. There were a number of things to reinforce that you weren't meant to compare the links of the bars in the first graph to the, to the second one, which I thought was pretty slick. Sometimes there are also things you can do, particularly if it's just one really massive category, where you can actually just take that category out and have your focus be on the, the other stuff, right? So I can think of an example one time, I was working with a pharmaceutical company and they were showing the distribution of spend across different marketing platforms. And so I don't remember which one was the biggest, but let's just say it was TV, right? TV, they spent a ton on and then everything else was this tiny stuff. So if you plotted everything on the graph, you couldn't see it. But one way to deal with that would be, we take TV out of the graph, we say, you know, we spent $80 billion. That's a number that's way too big that I just made up. On TV, and you just put that into words, and then, and here's what we spent on everything else. And then that allows you to use whatever scale is appropriate for all of the other ones. Sometimes there are things that you can do, depending on the scenario, where rather than show the absolute, you benchmark it against a certain point in time or um, against another category that can bring things in to a way that you can compare them directly. You, you lose some context there, so you want to be careful. Um, you know, John, what are other ways you deal with this? Sometimes we'll use waffle graphs or square area charts, but those are a little less common. Yeah. Um... I was actually thinking there was um, a really great piece in the New York Times a couple of days ago by David Leonhardt uh, talking about inequality. And they sort of had the bubbles, the, the circles, and then as you scroll through, each circle sort of stretched out into two circles mm -hmm. with a line connecting them to show like the top and the bottom. Um, so I thought that was a nice approach, but it kind of only works in an in a interactive animated way. You know, didn't, I don't know if you could really do the same thing in a static way. Um, but that's a great point, right? That if you yeah. are, if you're live or if you have some interactivity, that that does open up other potential approaches there where you can show yeah. one, then take it off the graph and then expand the graph to show the other right. or have that happen right. as people explore through the data. The other, the other one, just so that, just to not so much about high, well, I guess it's high and lows, but um, I saw a picture of the New York Times cover the other day um, when the new job numbers came out. And it basically was a bar chart of uh, job monthly the monthly jobs report, and then of course the you know the April jobs or the the April jobs report was like you know negative a billion, um, and they kind of had the chart going across the entire top of the of the page with this one, you know these two bars going all the way down the length of the page, um, and the reason I bring that up is because I think it's a really nice way of thinking about how to frame outliers and not trying to hide them. It's like really trying to emphasize them that this you see this whole length of the page really working with the data. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was half listening there because I was trying to find on Twitter the, uh, the feed that I mentioned. It's Bureau of Transportation Statistics, but I didn't find it as fast as I was talking. <laughs> okay. um, but for folks who want to follow up on that one. Um, so so there's, there's two questions here that are, that are, that are sort of similar. I'm going to let um, Wesley and AJ, if you both want to unmute yourself or, or however, um, they're both on maps. So um, mm -hmm. uh, Wesley's unmuted. So Wesley, why don't you go ahead and start and uh, sorry, AJ or Ajay, I don't know. Sorry if I mispronounced it. Feel free to also unmute yourself. Um, but both are, are uh, have questions for you on maps. Yeah. Well, I've come to the field uh, from an urban planning perspective and maps are a critical tool we use in reaching out to the public and presenting our plans to the public. But increasingly, since I've gotten into this, it does seem that geospatial data and maps play a really large role, a critical role in, um, in data viz. One of the examples, kind of to segue from what you were just talking about to what maps, uh, we've all seen the 2016 electoral map and the Trump people love to show this sea of red and a little bit of blue, but if you adjust for population and not geography, it's, it's, it's deceptive. So, uh, I, you know, I, uh, I've been making my way through this. Hooray! 
I, uh, and you don't see a single map, right? <laughs> I don't really see too much um, yeah. with regards to maps. And uh, I just wanted to get a, both Jay and I are interested to get your feeling uh, about, about maps. Awesome. Absolutely. And I will say uh, Alberto Cairo's recent book, the How Charts Lie, has some good examples of maps gone bad as well uh, that may reference some of those and some others. Yeah, the reason that you don't see any maps in our work is absolutely not because there's not a good purpose for maps. It's just because we don't deal with a lot of geospatial data and the clients that we work with don't deal with a lot of geospatial data. And so I will say, though, on the topic of maps, that because you have a map or because your data is geographical does not necess necessitate the use of a graph of a, a map. Wow, how much words can I mince in a single sentence? So because your data is geographical does not mean you have to use a map. So you always want to think about what you're trying to show and be aware of when we are encoding data on maps, typically the way that we do so is either by intensity of color, right, where usually the darker colors mean more of something and lighter less, or by some sort of area, right? We've all seen the graphs that have circles on them that the size of circle indicates something. And both intensity of color or relative intensity of color and relative areas are things that our eyes aren't great at. Uh, which means if there's a hot spot or a cold spot where either something's really big or something's really dark, that's easy to pick out. But as soon as everything becomes a similar shade or there are minor nuances in size, that becomes harder for us to both wrap our heads around and quantify uh, in a meaningful way. So these are some things to be aware of when you are using maps and trying to encode data on to maps. Um, you know, there's still certainly cases where you can do either of those things and it works quite well or can work well as an entry point. And maps can also be good, so they can be good if there's geographic concentration of something, or if you expect there to be geographic concentration of something and there's not, and you want to be able to show that, or if there's something about the geography itself that's important, or if you're communicating to people who may not be familiar with the geography, then having the map can be a way to help familiarize and sort of set that context for folks. Um, in the area of maps, um, I'm going to lose it off the top of my head. John, you may remember Tapestry last year, the, uh, Kenneth Field uh, has oh, done a lot of work in maps. And he was, he was just on something live yesterday or the day before I saw his name. So that may have been recorded. But he has a book and a lot of resources uh, on the area of maps and designing them well and many examples of uh, good and not so good that may be useful to check out for those who are dealing with geographical data. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I'll just put this, uh, if, if um, Wesley or anybody else wants to check out this book, um, Cartography, I'll put it yeah. in, the, in the notes. <laughs> um, it is fabulous. I mean, it's, it's I have it. Oh, here, so and here we have a visual of Alberto Cairo. Oh, there's Alberto's book, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I put that in there, in there too. So um, yeah, those are, those are two good books. Um, I'm just checking to see if we have any other questions? I don't think we do. Um, I will also put in just on this maps question, not to promote myself too much, but you know, every once in a while, um, the book that I have coming out in the fall has a chapter on maps too. So, um, congratulations, so, by the way. Thank you. It was number one in general library and information something or other. I don't know. Yes. Pre-orders for the win. Um, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what else um, do you want to talk about? Like current projects you're working on. Do you um, or do you want me to like test your brain on uh, on other on other uh, other? Uh, let me think. In terms of current projects, so I'm taking a lot of. I've been doing a lot of stuff with my kids lately because I play you know homeschool teacher in the morning, which um, yeah. I've learned very quickly. There's a reason that I don't teach tiny people in my day lives. Um, I have three kids, they're five, six, and the little one's four. And so we've been doing, but I've, for me, it's been uh, another silver lining of all of this has been, you know, I've long been interested in this idea of how do we teach kids this stuff younger, right? The oh. graphicacy, the ability to look at data or decide when you want to look at data and when that will help things. And so we've been doing a lot of fun projects that I probably never would have taken the time, honestly, to do. And my sample size is small with only three of them, but it's like super eye-opening for me as well, both as I think about 
how we teach some of these concepts, but then the things that I'm learning through their eyes. So we've done a yeah. ton of projects, both with data and collecting things. So this morning, for example, we were going through a book and we read the book and then we decided what data we were going to gather from the book. And so mm -hmm. the book was uh, Elephants Don't Ride the Bus. And so it's this collection, right, of different animals and why they shouldn't do things like, you know, send a hippo in a hot air balloon and so forth. Uh, but so we decided in going through because there were different numbers or numbers of people and animals and lots of different modes of transportation that had wheels. And so after reading it and looking at the pictures, we decided we were going to track the number of animals on each page, the number of people on each page, and the number of wheels on each page. And so today, I have it here, and I didn't bring it into the office, but today they made their data tables. So we went through, they each, they, you know, there were 13 pages, so they wrote numbers one through 13. They wrote their column names of the numbers of each thing that they're going to count. And then uh, Avery on his own decided, well, but I want, I want there to be lines. I want this to be very organized. And so he got out the ruler and he's drawing grid lines in this table, which like nobody told him to draw grid lines on a table. So I found that fascinating. And then we went through and they collected their data. And then tomorrow we're going to make line graphs out of the data. Or we did a project a couple of weeks ago where they rated everything from dinner and then we drew dot plots and bar charts and eventually a slope graph. And they're little, their attention spans are about 30 minutes at a time. So this, these projects take us weeks to complete. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was like, while you were talking, I was looking for, there was a new book coming out by Stephanie Posovic and mm -hmm. uh, a colleague where the book itself is a description of the data of the book. It's very meta. Mm. So there's like a spread meta. on the weight of the book or how many, you know, the weight of the page and how much ink is there. So, and I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to find it, but um, cool. just, yeah. So that one, I don't know when that's supposed to come out, but um, I'm excited about it because it's this kind of meta data viz uh, book, which should be fun. Yeah. Um, but then, so, cause I was, remember, I was like, how did we get on this topic? And it's cause you asked me about projects. So lots of right, projects yeah. with the kids and, and we were doing, so we're doing sort of logic math data on the one side and then my focus with them at least. And then my other one is story. So we're reading a lot of things. We've been mapping stories, understanding structures of stories, uh, which has been really interesting for me realizing how much logic there is in story and how we can translate a lot of what we learn through entertaining stories to then how we can communicate. And so one of the things that we're working on, we read The Wizard of Oz and we mapped it out in different ways and it yielded some unexpected aha moments for me when it comes to both teaching, I think, and communicating. So the next live event that we do in the community is actually going to be focused on what The Wizard of Oz can teach us about using story in a business setting. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. I have, I have many jokes to think about for that one, but I'll, I'll work on them. <laughs> There's something there, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, before I want, uh, there's a couple more questions, but before I do that, um, for this series, this, this, this digital discussion series, a uh, week after next, I'm trying to put a series together on teaching kids various things. Oh, cool. So I'll do the data viz session. I have one colleague that's gonna um, use oranges to teach kids how to take a 3D global map projection to a 2D Ooh. projection, so that should Ooh. be fun. And then someone else is gonna teach Scratch. Um, if anybody's out there has kids or, or uh, probably a little older than yours, Cole, but uh, this Scratch programming, uh, um, tool from MIT. Uh, we're using it here with my kids who are a little bit older than yours. Uh, it's been really fun. Um, it's a really nice uh, way to learn code. So he'll be teaching that. So, okay. okay. Uh, no more plugs. I don't promise, but maybe, maybe no more plugs. Uh, the orange okay, so, one though, that sounds like that could be good for little kids. Yeah. Right. Well, I remember a while ago, Vox did something where they had a video with a guy who had like an inflatable globe and demonstrating how hard it is to get an inflate, you know, that, that, that sphere to a 2D yeah. version. Yeah. So, um, so same kind of thing. Um, Wesley has a question for you about building a portfolio. So um, because of the different approaches you can take to data biz, I was wondering from the perspective of an employer, maybe anybody here uh, has an answer for me. Uh, are there niches that you can fall into? And, you know, do you want to think about, um, presenting static work and things done in Illustrator? Do you want to think more about doing things with D3 that are more interactive? Do you want to think about things that are done with consoles? Is there one area, like if you want to do static infographics or things for just um, uh, 
that are just going to be uh, visible as a as an image file. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to uh, build a portfolio that that shows a lot of of range, or do you want to use a port? Do you want something that narrows in on the types of work that you really want to do? I think you just answered your question with your question, right? Do you want to go broad and cover anything you possibly could, or do you want to show work that's reflective of the type of work you would like to be doing? I think I would, I would point towards the latter on that. So if you can be really specific about what is the sort of visualization that you want to be doing, what sort of tools do you want to be using, and then have your portfolio be reflective of those things, that that's going to be more likely to get your foot in the door in the sort of role that's where you'll be able to do those sorts of things. You know, there's always the question, I think, with anything, um, you know, I remember thinking about this when it was like grad school, do I get a master's in statistics or a master's in business? Do you go broad or do you go deep? And there's no right or wrong there. It comes, what I would urge you to think about is your personal preferences for what sort of work do you want to be doing? What sort of organization do you want to be at? And how do you align those things then with what your portfolio looks like so that it helps you get to that? Okay. The, the, the question becomes, though, if what I want to do is not exactly, uh, if the opportunities in those fields are limited, yeah. you want to also have that, that flexibility to say, well, I can't be a, a GIS or a data visual, a, a data mapper. Maybe I could jump in at a newspaper or a place like Urban and something like that. Yeah, I think that's definitely something to reflect on and be honest with yourself about, right? Of like, okay, I'm aiming here, which, so right now I'm likely not going to get there because of the competition or scarcity of roles. So yeah, what's what's a potential path or what are some paths look like that could get you there? And so yeah, I've been thinking about if that's step Z in the process, what are the, what are the next few steps look okay. like? And then just trying to, you know, it's, I think, for me, when I've had moments like that in my life or periods of my life where I'm trying to figure out you know, which way do I go next and how do I how do I prepare for that and how do I get an employer to value the things that I want to do and invest in that way, it's thinking, it's thinking really reflecting on what are the skills you already have, right, in terms of tools or the way you communicate or the work that you've done or the places that you've worked? Uh, what are the skills that you want to be continuing to use on a regular basis? What are the skills you're interested in that you'd like to develop that you don't have currently? And then try to map that against, and now what's out there in the marketplace given this and where where's their overlap? Where's their a little overlap where I might be stretching, but maybe that could be interesting. And where's there a ton of overlap where that would be like the perfect thing or, you know, the perfect next thing and just be clear about uh, what you're bringing and, and how that's going to match up. Because if you can then articulate, you know, that, that self uh, analysis then helps you articulate better to prospective employers so that you can really articulate what you are able to do, what value you bring, uh, and then also ask the smart questions to make sure it's going to be a fit uh, from your perspective. Great. Thank Those you. Just some random thoughts from there, a no, non-expert there. career <laughs> advice giver. <laughs> Well, I think that was right on. I'll just I'll just tag on because Wes, you mentioned uh, Urban, um, just from like uh, from the Urban perspective. You know, we have a data viz team, and most people on the data viz team, you know, mostly you know we have one person who does a lot of R, but all all the folks on the team do JavaScript, right? They do D three, Node, whatever. One person also has a lot of Illustrator skills, um, but then we have lots of other people who are good at data viz in terms of maybe we have a, a bunch of people who are really good at R. We have, you know, a bunch of people good at Excel. Um, we have a couple of Tableau people who, you know, who are good at Tableau. Um, so like, at, as Cole said, it kind of depends on where you see your role at that kind of organization. Um, so would you want to be more on the research side or purely data viz side? Like as a media organization, would it be a data journalism side or would it be on more of a, um, I'm not sure what Jeremy Bowers calls his his team, but it's more like the engineering side of things, right? Which is kind of those are all very different roles. So I think Cole, I think you're you're, you're right on. It's thinking about where you're going to be happiest, which is always an important consideration, <laughs> yeah. and then what you know level or type of skill do you want to develop so that you fit that fit that. 
Well, and even when you're thinking, particularly thinking about a career change, like what size of organization do you want to be? Yeah. You want to be small and scrappy where everyone's wearing a ton of hats, or do you want big and stable and a well-defined role? Because I think all of these play in and can help you uh, isolate potential matches better and, and uh, be uh, clear about what you're getting or clearer about what you're getting into. It helps you form better questions as part of the interview process so that you can yeah. be interviewing at the other side uh, effectively as well. And because I'll just say this because you both mentioned a host of uh, tools that it really depends on what you want to do also because it doesn't take fancy tools necessarily to do this stuff well, but it depends on what field you're in, right? So the yeah. research institution like Urban, yes, you have to have people who are highly adept at specialized tools. Or if you're, you mentioned GIS, if you're doing mapping, then yes, there's a host of tools that go with that. For my work, we're focused on business communication. So we're working primarily in Excel or Excel and Tableau or PowerPoint. And so you yeah. can do effective things uh, in any tool. You just want to be clear about who your audience is, right? What tools you've put, uh, particularly at prospective employers, what tools are people using? Uh, and, and that'll vary widely uh, depending on the, the angle that you take there. Um, so I'm going to turn it to Matthew, who has a question about um, if he's there. Oh, there he is. Go ahead, Matthew. Yes, thank you, um, Cole. It's great to have you uh, spend some of your time with us today. Very, very appreciative. Um, and it's interesting, um, you talked about um, hippos on hot air balloons and elephants on buses, but, um, and then Wesley's conversation, very, very interesting. We're a nonprofit um, and have a small data biz team and so forth, um, trying to do, um, you know, research and getting that, that story out. So your, your, your concepts of data and storytelling are very interesting. I'm, I'm curious, in fact, you just mentioned something about that you're, you're using Excel and Tableau for effective collaboration for business. When you look at um, some of the things, um, some of the techniques around product development, and that's specifically like um, design thinking or human-centered design and so forth, how does how does you know like if you're if you're writing a story for a hippo, <laughs> you're writing a story for an elephant, how do you in, in ensure that that that's that 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 does connect? There's been some some information on the chat about maps, and we we've been doing a lot of maps during this COVID-19 crisis and um you know we, we we look at our stats and we're like you know okay you know so many you know hundreds and thousands of people are hitting our maps and that's great but you know are, are they actually telling telling the stories and you know we had a really cool story where uh, you know one of the governors actually um we know that he was quoting from one of our dashboards and i were like oh great you know that was that was a, that was a home run but how, how do we as data viz people ensure that there's a connection there and that there's a way to 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 connect that connection ensure that 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 the, the maps or whatever tool we're deciding to use for that that you know business level presentation is actually connecting yeah, great question and challenging question, right? Because yeah, you can look at stats like number of views, but you don't know if that's somebody clicking on it and then immediately turning their attention to somebody else, right? And so the cases where you can, you know, you, you have the public figure who's quoting from it or in a business scenario, you know, the executive who points to the data as making a decision or something like that, you get some of those. But I think the more you can think about how do you develop a feedback loop when it's not embedded and you can get that it doesn't even necessarily need to be you know your audience who's out there if you're putting maps out to the public for example but it means putting your work in front of other people who've never seen it before or one way to do this i should say is putting your work in front of people who might be like your audience who've never seen it before and have them talk about it you know are they focusing on the or do they want to focus on it do they understand it in the right way are they taking out the right things or pulling out stories in the way that you intend can be useful for figuring out if what you've designed is can be working in the way that you want it to or make adjustments if needed. And so I'm always a big proponent of feedback, no matter how you're communicating. And when you can get feedback from your audience directly, that's ideal, right? But that's not always possible. And so then we want to think about, well, what assumptions can we make about our audience? How big of a deal is it if those assumptions don't play out that way? If we're wrong about our assumptions, how might we test this with other people who are like our audience? And really putting yourself as much as you can, stepping out of your role and your familiarity with the data and trying to think critically about your audience 
who are they? What do they care about? What sort of constraints do they have on their time and their attention? What are they interested in? And how can you make what you want to happen fit in with that, right? So that the value proposition to your audience is clear. So in our workshops in a business setting, we'll often go through an exercise with the big idea worksheet. Um, there's an exercise actually with it on the community in case you want to check that out. Uh, but it's very simple. It's, you know, who's your audience? What do they care about? What's at stake for them, right? Both on the positive side of what do they stand to gain from doing the thing that you want them to do, but also what do they stand to lose if they don't? Um, so it can sometimes highlight different things that can be useful. And then what's the main thing you need to get across? And so the big idea, Nancy Duarte originally introduced it in Resonate, um, but it, it has these components, right? So it articulates your point of view, conveys what's at stake, and it's a complete and single sentence. And so we'll often go through this exercise, just to get a really clear understanding of our audience and that thing that we need to have happen, right? The big idea, the message we want to get across or the action that we're trying to inspire, which can just be a useful tactic for setting the data, setting the viz aside and thinking critically about the person and the people on the other end of it. And then coming back to the data and now trying to figure out how do you make that stuff work together? So I think if you can combine that sort of critical thinking about your audience with the feedback loop, whether from your audience or others who might be able to give insight, that that can be one way to try to ensure that what you're doing is having its intended um, goals met. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Yeah. Um, we just have a few minutes left. Um, and I don't see any other questions in the um, in the chat box. So um, I guess you were talking a few minutes ago about uh, about the tools that you use for the for your you know mostly in the in the business sector. Um, and I'm curious within let's say within Microsoft. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll put I'll put you to the test maybe a little bit. So what are your um, favorite and least favorite um, parts of let's just say PowerPoint. Like do you have a favorite thing in PowerPoint they think people maybe they don't know about and they should use and a least favorite thing that maybe they use and they shouldn't? Well one thing I actually discovered recently which is a little embarrassing because it's probably something I should have known existed uh, long ago but you can hide slides. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was very useful for being able to have things to reference or to be able to pull up if you maybe need it but you're not sure you need it. Um, there also is a trick in PowerPoint that for those who, because we, it, on the business side, we often deal with the scenario where we might be presenting live or we might be sending something out that's meant to stand on its own. And so mm -hmm. oftentimes we use a PowerPoint deck for both of those things. But then when you've got animation built in, people who open it up where you're sending it out may not realize that and have it in that mode, but there's actually uh, what is it? You put an S, I think it is. It'd be better if I knew this for sure. I can look it up afterwards and follow up. Um, but where instead of dot PPX, it's dot PPS, I think, or yeah, Google I think it, right. yeah. where it, where when you open up the PowerPoint, it opens in slideshow mode. And now someone could yeah. still back out of that, but if you wanted something to be seen in that way where you can do that. These are one of my favorite things though. I don't know if I have a favorite thing because I really, I use PowerPoint as a blank slate. I start off with a completely yeah. blank thing every time so that I'm adding to it. Cause the thing I hate most about PowerPoint is how easily people, dis when people decide to use it as a teleprompter because that's awful for everybody. Yes, for everybody, yeah. You know, the hiding a few months ago where they made it so that when you create your, P if you create a PDF, <clears throat> excuse me, out of PowerPoint, it actually doesn't include the hidden slides. And it used to include the hidden slides, which was like so annoying mm -hmm. because they're hidden for a reason. So yeah. just put a little if statement in the code, like, come on. Anyway, okay. Um, okay, so we got a few minutes left. Um, anything else you want to chat about quickly? Well, I'm curious because you you posed me the question earlier about the what's going to happen with people who visualize data and teams of people who visualize data and how does all of this change it? You work on and with teams who visualize data. What's it going like? What's your feeling there? I mean, I, uh, so I mean, again, just guessing. Um, my instinct tells me that um, there. Well. So my instinct is that there's going to be cutbacks and my guess would be on the data, data viz teams, that will be a prime place for, for places to cut, um, would be my guess. On the other hand, 
um, this is a finite event. Um, and so I do wonder um, uh, for large organizations, whether they will try to hold off uh, laying or furloughing people for as long as they can. For small organizations, you know, if you're in a nonprofit of a dozen people, you know, I just, I, I Is it I common I, though I, in those sorts of organizations to have a person dedicated to data viz? Because this, no, this see, always felt a yeah. little foreign to me. I think it, at a place like Urban, it makes sense. But yeah. it, companies, I always get a little skeptical when there is a team that does data viz, because you can't yeah. do that in absence of all the other pieces. For me, data viz is a part of a larger process. <laughs> the, pe the person who's doing it right. needs to do the rest right. of the process too. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, for, for Urban, right, we have, you know, more than 500 people um, you know, we're, I would call us, you know, a big, a big group. So, you know, our data viz team is, is funneling a lot of information from the analysts. I think if you're in a nonprofit of a dozen people, the data viz person is probably wearing multiple hats, right? That's the communications person that might be the social media person as well. So, um, but it could be the case that the data viz is just, you know, it's de-emphasized a little bit. It might just be a short-term thing where, you know, where a group was going to do a dashboard they were going to put a dashboard online with their data maybe that's something that's you know that's that's now going to be put on pause for six to nine months or, or however long it's going to be um it's hard to know i mean um uh you know i think uh speaking from uh personal experience of my wife's experience uh, she works at a hospital and they've laid a lot of people off um that kind of thing you don't you wouldn't think instinctively that hospitals will start to lay people off um, but they're also being hurt their bottom line because a lot of medical care is not being performed. Um, but it's also what's going to happen six months from now or two months from now when the people who are on ventilators are coming to these different hospitals. So, um, so I think it's, it raises a lot of interesting questions and I'm not sure uh, how it's going to play out. But I think, uh, I think what we will see, especially based on the conversation I had yesterday at one of these discussions, um, that the next round of financing from Congress will probably be fairly different in nature in terms of where the money goes. So um, we'll just have to see. Um, so we're gonna have to wrap up. Uh, Hal, I'm sorry, you're gonna, you have a really great question and it's something that I'm working on right now. Um, so a lot of great questions. Cole, I wanna give you the last word to, well, then I will wrap up, but I wanna give you like, do you have like one, uh, maybe like a good, uh, um, like a great, like your closing, like great piece of advice for people as they, uh, go off to the rest of their day and like maybe things that they should think about? Yeah, the, I mean, I think the question before, I think it was Wesley about, you know, how do I build my portfolio? Where do I go from here? The changing times like we're in now are an excellent time to take assessment, right, of what you're doing and like use this time, I think, to to try to align what you want to do with what you can do and, and the opportunities that are out there because the, we're in this like strangely constrained environment in ways that we've never had to deal with before. There, that breeds creativity and breeds opportunity. And so it's really easy, and I catch myself doing this too, right? To just get caught up with all the crap that's going on right now and to feel really down as a result of that. So trying to turn that around and considering what opportunities does this bring? How can you take advantage of those? And how do you invest in yourself, right? Improve your skills. Uh, and of course I have to turn that into a, a promo for all of the stuff that we're doing, right? Check out the community, uh, all the resources, that are on the, the blog and the website at storytellingwithdata.com. You know, find things there that uh, could be interesting projects, interesting ways to build your portfolio. And really think about when you are communicating with data, how do you do that, not first and foremost for yourself, but first and foremost for your audience? Because when you can take their needs into mind and make those things work in concert with your own, that's when we can communicate successfully and really drive the change that we see. Love it. That's a great positive way to, uh, to wrap up today. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for chatting with us, Cole. This was thanks great. Uh, it was great, everybody. Um, next week, uh, we'll be back doing these discussions on Tuesday afternoon. It has not yet been announced, but it will be up uh, maybe tomorrow. Uh, where I'm going to talk with some of my colleagues at, um, in what we call our tech and data department at Urban about uh, women in tech, women in data. Um, and some of the challenges and, and opportunities that they that they're seeing and talking about, and um, yeah, so this was great, Cole. Thanks again so much. It's great oh, to see you. Me. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Bye, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks a lot.